there. There we are, live. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I think this is uh, episode eight, first live guest in the studio. <laughs> Full-time investor, Mandy Branham, uh, solutions-driven property management. Got a lot of shit going on right now, but so does everybody else. So um, that's about all I'm going to do to be able to get us going here today. Andrew and I can talk real estate for hours. Uh, I need to set out an introduction here. If you don't know, uh, this is Andrew Brennan. Um, I invest in real estate uh, is what you usually say to people. Um, I'm going to let him tell his story about how long he's investing, what kind of got him going. But um, I need to point out that when I decided to leave my job, I called three people. Actually, Larry was the first one, hubby, so he already knew. I called my visionary at the time just to try and like help me breathe through knowing what I was going to do. And you were the third person to be able to say, what the fuck did I just do? And am I going to be okay? So, um, so yeah, so no other uh, introductions here. Tell us, how did you become a full-time investor? I was blessed to lose my job in October 2009. I got downside, downsized, and figured that uh, I, I was dabbling a little bit in real estate at the time. Um, commuting uh, was quite a long drive every day. Most days I went to the office, so it was about an hour and a half. And I thought, you know what, I'm much happier doing real estate. So I How many did you have before you left or before uh, you downsized? About six, six single-family homes. Six single families. Yeah. So you hadn't gotten into any duplexes yet. No. No JVs no. at that time. No. Nothing. No. Okay. Okay. So you're downsized, and uh, and and you just said, I need to be able to make this work. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Like, were you like? Uh, again, you say blessing. Glasses yeah. half full, glasses half empty. But um, what were you thinking, like financially? Or did you have a time span? Did you say I'm going to give myself six months before I get my butt back with a resume? Um. I guess I was a little bit lucky that I got a severance package for, I don't know, like six or eight months or something okay. like that. So I had yep. a bit of a, I guess, a soft landing. Yeah. Um, so I um, I tried to get things going while I was still um, getting drawn a continuous salary. I'll, I'll admit that I was still applying for jobs okay. here and there, maybe not having enough confidence in myself. Yep. Um, but because I was being selective and, you know, there wasn't much – jobs local that i uh, paid well compared to what i was getting i never ended up getting anything so you you did you so if you were trying to say i need to replace my income cash flow were you trying to replace your entire income or you were just kind of like i'm not sure where this were going were you going with a long-term wealth plan or were you going dollar for dollar paycheck to cash flow uh good question because actually interesting enough i will probably never replace my <laughs> actual income because, really? because there's not there's no need to pay myself that much when I do real estate right okay, okay. so I used to make you know uh, 140 150 yeah with uh, you know some benefits yep. and stuff like that where you know even last year in the great years I had I only paid myself fifty thousand dollars in dividends when did you stop getting government checks Oh, for a while, yes, yes. I owed uh, I owned twenty million dollars in real estate and was uh, technically my family was below the poverty line, so they were sending me taxable like just like everybody else gets because I invested in a corporation. I didn't have any personal income, right. so was getting um, HST credit, yeah. child tax credit, stuff yeah. like that. So. so that's one of the biggest things that people always say to me is they have this idea that they need to specifically replace that. 150,000 with 150,000. What's a good like mind shift? Like how did you uh, change from being able to say, well, I made 150, how can I live on 50? Like what are some of the other things that kind of changed along with it? Well, it depends on um, your taxable benefits and um, tax planning strategies. Did you work with an accountant a lot? Uh, yes, not not so much at the start, but uh, as you know, like I have weekly standing lunch appointment with my accountant every Friday, yeah. right? No, to go over. Uh, sometimes we just socialize. Sometimes yeah. we go over strategies. Sometimes uh, I need to run something by him, right? Yeah. So, but um, like a lot of things, people don't understand the difference of say, you know, paying yourself to say pay for your vacation or having your corporation pay for your vacation and taking it as a taxable benefit, right? Right, it's a huge difference in taxes, right? Um, you know, there's a debate whether you have your car personally and expense mileage back to your company or against your properties if you're 
uh, if you're holding properties personally, not through a corp, or do you have a company vehicle and maybe need to take a small standby charge? How did you learn all this stuff? Uh, I love money. Right? I love business. <laughs> um, talking to people. I've been doing this yeah. for 12 years now. 12. Okay. Right. So, you know, if you do something for 12 years for, you know, some weeks I, yeah. when I was building the business, it wasn't unusual to do 80 hours a week. Yeah. You do 80 some, hours a week. Right. So I'm not, I'm not more than 80 hours a week. I mean, I could have done things probably a little bit better, but um, the more you're engaged in doing something, the more you talk to people, the more you can yeah. learn, right? Yeah. So that was, that was kind of my, my first question is how long did it take to go from the hustle, from the 80 hours, from the, I'm going to show myself that I've got a six to eight month package for my business that I'm going to make it and that real estate's going to be a full-time gig. So for me, just quickly, I had a $15,000 wholesale fee and I'd said to Larry that, you know what, this is almost six months worth of pay for me at the time when I was only part time. I said, give me six months with this paycheck and I'm going to prove to you that I will have been able to do what I need to do. So what, how do you know, how long did it take to go from hustle, hustle, hustle to you being able to say I've made it? Um, there's a specific property that I remember stating to people I made it. So I was trying to build a business and we bought a triplex in Collingwood that um, was leaning over. So we couldn't get a um, mortgage. They wanted a structural report, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I called up one of the investors I had and I said, I need to know within a couple hours, I need 200 and I think it was like $203,000 cash or something like that. No, you can't see the property. Know this, know that. You just have to tell me yes or no. And he said, okay, I'll do it. So at that point, I figured that, that I had made it. Okay. Right? That was probably about five years into the business. Five years into the business. Yeah. So, but from the time that you left your job when you had about six single family homes mm -hmm. to that old realization point, because <laughs> you don't have to know the exact answer to this. Mm -hmm. How many properties do you think you had in between that? From, okay, so that's, um, I probably bought maybe another 20 or 25 okay. from that, from those six to that particular one in Colorado. Okay, so 12 years you've been out of your job. Five years you went. No, no, I'm uh, 12, been on my job for almost 10 years, but I've okay. been doing it for about 12 years now. Okay, yeah. so in 12 years, we'll say that six were bought before you left your job. Yeah. Okay. Here you are at this like realization point, nice triplex with a partner, pick it up. You got two hours to make a phone, to make a say yes. And you have maybe another 20. How many do you have now? 125, 130. That would be 125 houses, 130 houses. I remember Mark Gano sat down with me one time, showed it to Mark there. Um, and I said, how many properties do you have? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, I could not conceptualize that somebody didn't know how many flipping properties they had. <laughs> I know the range. It changes, doesn't it? Because you well, acquire new ones, sell some. I, I, I did sell, uh, I think, one this year. One. one. I got a couple out of sale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Bought, we bought a bunch. But. Did you find in your business that you're, that you're letting go of the bottom 10%, as my coach would say, you know? Um, starting to sell off single-family homes. Yep. Right? Um, just... Um, not worth it. Like I tell my coaching clients and stuff like that, do not buy single family homes. They just shoot you down from a debt coverage ratio and qualifying stuff like that. Same with the condo, right? Yeah. Condo's mm -hmm. even worse when you consider the uh, condo fees. Um, but I am starting to have logistics issues. Right. So now we're buying, we're trying to buy, you know, like four, six units and up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, we'll still do the odd conversion if it's like a, a really good attractive price. And there's like, you know, we might have uh, 50 or $60,000 in equity after renovations. Yeah. So, and sometimes those are, are good because, you know, you might have an investor with plenty of money, but he wants to get his feet wet with something a little bit uh, smaller. Like for example, I am um, working on a 12 plex where I'm looking for 600,000. So I asked two people to split it. One guy was new, didn't want to put that much into one property. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll put my money in. How would you buy me out of this one property? Yeah. And, you know, I'll range it so it's 50 grand for you to get in. I'll get 300,000 and I'll do 
the 12 bucks. That sure. is, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of my questions because this gets me every single time that I talk to you. Your creative brain, like how do you even think of things sometimes to be able to say, well, if you did this and I did this and this second mortgage over here and this person did a VTB and I could use this for six months and then over here, like how do you piece all these puzzles? Or is that part of the strategy, how you've created this? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, you know, I, I would say I have a, a natural ability to work with numbers, maybe kind of manipulate You numbers. think? I always like, don't, joke. Don't ask me to be Mr. Socialite at a party because I'll sit there and not say much. That's not one of my skills. But some of my skills are to, um, I guess, to challenge myself to maximize leverage and to creatively come up with solutions, whether it be financial solutions or job site uh, renovation solutions or whatever, right? So. But if you're not challenging yourself, and in your case, if it's financial challenges, then then I think that's where you become stagnant and you're not growing anymore or you're whatever. Gosh, just in the short time that we had reconnected, I was like, oh, I feel challenged again. I feel like, why am I doing this? And you're actually having to answer those questions to be able to say, well, I've chosen to be able to do it this way because... And you have the answer to that. But um, so some of the creative financing strategies that has allowed you to accumulate such a, a mass portfolio, um, V, I put, oh, JVs. I was like, JVs, yeah. right? Yeah, that's that's the biggest benefit I've had. Right? People tell me that JVs are the most expensive money. Why are you doing that? There are a lot of headaches. I never want to partner with anybody. Answer some of those questions. They're correct. JV money is the most expensive money. You're usually give up half the profit. Yep. But the thing is, um, if you can no longer do any more deals, half of something is better than 100% of nothing. Yeah. Right. And there are times where, you know, there may be a JV that's not the best fit. Um, and, you know, you maybe should not accept every possible JV partner. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, could you sit down and have a beer or a glass of wine and some yep. dinner yep. with this yep. JV partner? Yep. You know, could you go on vacation with them, you know, maybe not for a full seven days, well, but for a weekend or something, but just you're that you're having yeah, the same yeah. personality connection, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's just going to be, you know what, as long as there's some respect, right? You don't have to be friends, right? Yeah. But, you know, there has to be some respect and some trust, right? Right. Uh, you don't necessarily want somebody that micromanages too much, right? Because um, what I what I often tell JV partners is, and this is why a lot of them don't even worry about seeing the property and stuff like that, is you're investing in me and my skills and my knowledge. Yes. And the numbers you're not you're not investing because you know the certain property uh, is, is you know it's already nicely painted or we're going to put a nice you know bathroom in or something right like that, right yeah it's about numbers right so would you say that the quality of your JVs have changed from when you were in growth mode in the first five years to who you now accept into your into your business yes yeah yeah so I try and. Um, make sure that the JV partner probably has at least a quarter of a million bucks or more. Yep. Right. Um, you know, if I'm doing six, 10, 12 units, you're now probably looking at probably half a million dollar investment. So I can, I can pair up a couple of JVs or I can be a little bit maybe uh, strategic yep. and uh, maybe take advantage of the secondary financing yep. or VTBs or whatever, right. Yeah. To get things going. Yep. But um, to take on a JV partner now that uh, I th would only do like one, duplex is not really worth my no. my time no um no i mean i have taken on the role of joint venture queen that's because you have the role of vtb king um why don't why don't just you know what uh i'm not sure the necessarily the level of, of investment let's just talk what is a vtb and uh, a couple of the scenarios even just like I don't want to say low level because I know some of your phenomenal stories, but are there some that are just like the average get into it kind of VTBs that, that the viewers can, can learn from? Well, the simplest one would be something like a 10% VTB on a duplex purchase. Okay. okay. So VTB, the vendor take back, the seller's going to take back a portion. Most of the time it's a secondary position, but we do sometimes do first um, position. Um, that first position would be a significantly higher than 10%, obviously. Yeah, so like 90. It, uh, doesn't always have to be. Okay. Um, so, for example, we bought a building with a laundromat and we got a 70% yep. VTB. Okay. And then I put a $120,000 $120, private second behind it. So with like the a, seller or with another? With a, with a private lender. With a private lender. Right. So, okay. 
Um, and this property, we're adding an actual apartment where we turn yeah. the, the other two units over. We're, we're trying to get the revenue up on the laundromat. Yeah. So we closed privately uh, with the v VTB and the private second. And we got the VTB for, I think it was 70% loan to value for a year. Right. So it gives us a year to take care of this stuff, right? right. So we got into, uh, the purchase was like, I don't know, 580. We got into it, like the down payment was like 55000 or something. Right. Right? right. So we got into it pretty cheap. That's that creative right. strategy. And um, so it gives us a time to turn it around. Yeah. Now, this is a mixed-use commercial. So, you know, we're trying to get the building up to probably 900 or a million, spend maybe 70,000 or whatever, right? And that should be enough to hopefully get a, you know, 65, 70% loan-to-value uh, commercial mortgage and take out the first and yeah. the second. Yeah, right? yeah. Now, one of... Uh, I but, Sorry, but going yeah. back to the simpler one. Yes, the simpler yes. one. Yes. Simpler one, yes. So for a duplex, okay? So traditionally, a lot of banks will not do a VTB. There is right. still one bank that will do it. Yeah. I, don't, I won't say one okay. bank or another. But, you can reach out if you want yeah. to know the bank that does it. Um, so what we try and do is we get 80% loan to value from the first mortgage from a traditional bank. And then we try and convince the seller to put uh, 10%. Right. So then that requires us to put down 10%. So what are some of the benefits to a seller uh, of of taking on a 10% VTB? Okay, so I'm not a tax professional. Got it. Okay, but this is what I would, uh, this is why the benefits, yeah. uh, so the benefits I pitched to the seller would be, um, I may pay a higher price, right. slightly higher price. So I might make two offers actually, one with VTB, one with that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, they will pay them an interest rate. Okay. Okay. So, you know, especially if they're a tired landlord and you think they're just going to move their money into a bank account or mutual funds or whatever, right? Um, you know, we might pay them say four to 8%, right? Right. Depending on the, on the opportunity and stuff like that. They can defer some of the capital gains. Okay. So if they took a fifty thousand dollar VTB, technically they didn't collect their profit of fifty thousand dollars that particular year. Right. They would uh, defer it up to five years. Okay. And so whenever they actually collected the the final portion of the sales price, that's when they would incur their tax or capital gains. Right. Right. So if, you know, um, if you're holding a property personally, yeah, it's a lot more of an advantage to do a VTB because it's a lot easier to. Uh, tax shift, right? Yeah. Where, because um, you're, you know, you're floating in the the tax brackets, right? Right. But if you hold it in a corporation, you know, you can still offset some of it, right? Especially if you have other uh, properties, perhaps do capital depreciation on, right? In, in additional years, right? So it, it, the benefit is still there, but not can sometimes be not as, as good as it's personal. And and I think if I'm correct, your strategy is to always ask for a VTV. Um. We, we try, yeah. yeah. We always try, like especially now that we're doing stuff um, like some of the commercial stuff. Now we're having challenges with some of the banks when we're buying. Okay. So yeah. I bought a twenty-unit building. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the seller was willing to do a, a VTB. Bank didn't want it. So we just got the seller to put a uh, two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar first mortgage on a property we had free and clear. Right. Right. So in the eyes of the seller, he's holding a VTB, right? So are you negotiating this agent to agent and Andrew's brain has to talk to your agent and then the agent talks to the agent and the agent play telephone to the seller? It's it's a lot harder when there's agents involved. We do a lot of uh, private sales as yeah. well. Um, so you're, you're going to have better success when you can actually sit right in front of the seller and tell them the benefits yeah. Yeah. Right? and yeah. talk directly to them. Yeah. We still do them from time to time through agents, right? Yeah. Your agents just must know now, know what your strategies are. Yeah. So, so then my other thing was because again, you reassure you you have this calming effect when it comes to leverage. Mm -hmm. But what is your idea of what your portfolio should be at? Do you look at things portfolio wise? Are you eight? Are you do you like to max out your leverage, or how have you continued to grow? So, um, okay, so a couple of questions there. I <laughs> lately I have been thinking about uh, debt equity. Okay. So return on equity. So the challenge with that is, you know, you have a, so if you go back to why I said you can't uh, or should not do single family homes. Right. You got a single family home that's worth, maybe it's worth 400,000. Okay. The rents may be 1800. Well, the mortgage um, would only allow you to carry about, sorry, the rental income would only allow you to carry a mortgage. Maybe, 240,000 yeah. depending on interest rates, right? Yeah. And even worse if it's a condo, right? Right. So instead of getting, uh, I said, 
What is it? Four hundred. So instead of getting a mortgage for three twenty, you're leaving about eighty thousand dollars equity on the table. Yeah. On top of the already eighty. 80, 80 yeah. Right? So one of those there's, there's a challenge there that we're being aware of. Uh, the other thing is some of our investors, including myself and probably yourself, are capped out and can't get any more mortgages, so yeah. we can't refinance stuff. So I'm looking at strategies to actually free up cash and uh, be aware that you know I have, we have too much equity that's not being to good use. Because if, if I was able to free up cash even by refinancing, um, by bringing on a joint venture partner and let's yeah. say uh, he, t he, he gets a new mortgage at the, the right rate and um, you know today's mortgage rates have gone down a little bit so the back to the low yeah, 2.99 yeah, so three right if you if you're you know if you're not uh, borrowing your money back all you're doing is saving three percent right on you, right like so when someone pays down their mortgage early they're getting if your interest rates three percent you're only get a three percent return right. right yeah and you know I, I have to get pretty much three percent per month to get out of bed right? yeah it's 30 percent yeah. per year to get yeah. out of bed right so how is he interesting I don't get out of bed for less than 30 percent. So that means every deal that he's looking at is a minimum 30% return on investment. Yeah. Half of that to a JV partner, half of that to himself. And we were just kind of talking about that. It almost has to go up because some of the investors are looking for larger and larger returns. But, but yeah, but it's, it's a percentage, right? A so, percentage, yeah. Yeah, so the dollar amount will go yeah. up, right? Okay. Um, but, you know, so I'm look, worried about uh, debt equity. Yeah. I, I set myself a goal of getting into a $100 million portfolio. Okay. So I'm about maybe 65% there. Okay. Um, I got just four years more to, to reach the goal. It was only, it was only five. I went, I was at 50. I had a five year goal to go from 50 to a hundred. So, um, you know, obviously I'm not going to be buying single family homes to duplexes, no. right? No. So now I have to, you know, re leverage or think differently about leverage, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and it's interesting that you say a $400,000 home with $1,800 rental income. But I've talked to people who own homes in Oakville that are worth 800000 And they're all upset that they can't refinance up to the 80% loan to value. You know, they might be mortgaging at 400000 mm -hmm. leaving $400,000 equity on the table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just kind of go, is that the strategy? Whereas, you know, so would you say maybe, hey, throw a second mortgage on top of there at at uh, six to eight percent, if you're able to find it, it depends. Uh, I mean, six percent is not that pricey. It really depends on what you're going to use the money for. Right. If you're if you're going to get a you know a couple hundred thousand at sixty percent, and, <laughs> and only um, and only get ten percent return on it, not worth it. Probably not worth it. Right. 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 But um, like I remember once I was uh, I was giving a presentation and I was telling somebody how I uh, I put a second mortgage on one of my properties at 12%. Yes. Yeah. says 12%. Why would you pay 12%? And I said, because it was simple. I turned around and I got 92% return on my money. Right? Yeah. Wasn't hard to do. No. Okay. But that's perfect. Excuse me. That's a perfect example of doing it. You say it's not hard to do, but out there it is like, there are people that, that aren't in the rhythm yet of being able to find the next deal, be inside of that creativity that you have. Um, so, I mean, like genius is the way to be able to make 92% return. Out it's, there. It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science? No, it's, it's really not. So your strategy, your main strategy to be able to build your $50 million portfolio was? Uh, raise money. Raise money. Find larger opportunities for, with bigger lifts. Yeah. Right? So. Um, we're focusing on stuff that a uh, few projects we've got. Um, uh, one, one of my uh, buildings, I, I emptied the second floor, and the four units are going to six. So uh, I want to talk about that property because I remember that property. And um, it was a large building, and I had been pre warned by another investor that it needed 250, like it was like a large number worth of renovations. And I thought, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that from this gentleman. And I'm going to walk through with you and I'm going to see what you wanted to do. And you are like, you just have a different way of being able to walk through a building and go, I get it. All of these things need to be done, but they don't all need to be done at once. How do you determine what, how long your renovations can take or what your time horizon is for, for certain products? So your vision is, is incredible when you see a property and what it could be. Yeah. So like that particular building, a couple of things to keep in mind. I don't know if I'd spend $250,000 in say cosmetic improvements for 
a building that's downtown that has no parking. Yeah. Which comes with, and it's not it's downtown Midland. It's not downtown Toronto. Right. Yeah. Comes with, you know, it's not a trendy area to have, no. you know, to catch the subway. You don't need a car. Um, and sometimes you just do things over time, right? Yes. Um, but that particular building, you know, if I recall correctly, we paid uh, five hundred seventy thousand for yeah. it. We got a five hundred thousand dollar VTB at four percent for ten years. Yes. So, and I just had come off selling a single family home with one of my JV partners and almost had 70,000 bucks. Right? right. Yeah. So, um, so you just got 70 in the down payment yeah. on this. No, fine. Nothing. Hard right. on that one. No, right? no. So you used a VT, you used a JV property with equity, sold that off for the reasons that you needed to sell it off and then transitioned into real estate on your own. So would you say that from your first 50 million, a lot of it's with JVs and maybe the next stuff is not going to be as much as you create your equity? Um, I would say probably $40 million worth from the first 50 was with JVs. Okay. And uh, maybe, hopefully maybe... 20, 25 million to 30 million would be with JVs of the next 50 million. Okay. So I'd like to retain my ownership. Like I, I've, uh, I, I took on a new business partner, which were yeah. great friends. Oh right? yeah. So, um, didn't need a business partner. He didn't need me. No. Right. So, but part of being in this business is having fun. We, we have lunch <laughs> almost every day. We go on vacation. <laughs> We Rolling maybe go, Stones concert. We maybe go to the bar a little too much, right? It's a beautiful thing. We don't have to get up for work, right? <laughs> and um, so we're doing we're doing that. And so you know, it, he he's going to help by he's taking on some roles that I was doing before. Now I'm more on the say maybe strategic financial planning yeah. and raising money and capital and yeah. stuff around. He's on the building acquisitions and some of the right. locations, right? Yeah. So. Um, Consider if, if I still consider that you know what him him and I yeah, partners, not, not, a, not a joint yeah, venture yeah. partner yeah yeah we looked probably maybe half of our acquisition right yeah. like we've we, the, since we've been doing this for uh, eight or ten months we've done uh, twice as many deals without JV partners as we have as you have with, with JV, JV partners, partners. Yeah. yeah I remember one time you myself and Susan White Livermore had to go down to a meeting in Toronto for like nine o'clock we were late we didn't understand traffic <laughs> <laughs> we were like, what? why are all these people in such a rush like this is not what my day starts out there's, with. there's this big yellow things out there and sometimes school buses apparently too Miss that. Don't ever have to get involved with that. Just some of the perks of being a full-time investor. Um, Larry, what time are we at here? Not that I, not that it really matters, but I just want to make sure that we're uh, three, minutes. three minutes. Okay, three minutes to our half an hour. Bully. I would. So uh, outside of order here, not that it really matters. I'd love you to be able to describe a day in the life of. Now, keeping in mind, I am going to ask you the next question: a week in the life of, just to be able to kind of give people an idea of what your, no, maybe it's not 80 hours anymore, but what does your week look like? What does your day look like? Sorry, day. Uh, Sorry. Well, often my priority is who I'm having lunch with, because that is very important. If you need, okay. to, you need yeah. to, you know, yeah. uh, this business, you know, being a home office, stuff yeah. like that can be in isolation. Yeah. Okay. So um, having lunch with a like-minded uh, person to bounce ideas off um, can really help Keep you motivated and yeah. build your business. Yeah. Okay. Um, usually, there's there's issues going on. Might be uh, stuff related to buying the property or joint venture partner looking for some information. Staff issues. Uh, staff issues. Uh, we do a lot of our own property, or uh, we hand off a lot of stuff to property management, so there's not quite yeah. as many staff issues. But um, it's just you know the. Sometimes you get too bogged down with the uh, working in the business yep. instead of working on the business. Okay. Yeah. But um, I always try and keep in mind that I need to raise money every day and I need to look at okay. buying building portfolio every day. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I, not that I want to waste money, but I know I'm not a big believer in going back and circling back to see if I can save fifty dollars and clean in a building. I'd rather spend time on going to make five hundred thousand in right. a building. Right. Oh, yes. So sometimes you need the right staff to take care of some of the smaller stuff. Yeah. Right. But I try not to sweat the smaller stuff. Now. I remember when you were a fr when you framed some of your buildings. I liked that. Uh, you did. Yeah. You did. And then I remember it being like that's not going to fit in anymore yeah. into your schedule. I like actually. I I'm I'm the best renovator we have. Right. right. 
So the problem is, I you know, and you're I used the to, highest price renovator too. Well, I don't charge myself, but um, and I used to like doing it, right? Yeah. But the problem is, I would, I would commit to a week behind, like not even just not too long ago, we had 22 projects on the go. We don't even have that many staff, right? Right. So I would say to him, okay, I'll come in my frame, and I wouldn't show up. And it's like I thought you were gonna show up. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to, I just couldn't. Right. So I, I stopped even doing that. I stopped telling them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I don't even I like, I don't no. even cut my own grass. I don't do no. my own snow. I don't yeah. do anything, right? But yeah. Um, but being in real estate, if that's what you love, right, that's what you do, right? So if if you want to be the guy that does the renovations, right, and do them, you just realize you have to you're you're hampering your overall growth. But if it's within within your goal plan. Well, it's, and I agree, except don't have unrealistic goals. So I talked to a gentleman the other day that wanted to retire in a year, but he wanted to, he, but he was like, I can't believe they quoted me 3000 for demo. I'll do that myself. But I say, well, you can't leave your job if, if what you're doing is demo. Uh, and so he really needed to understand where the value is in building a portfolio and not getting stuck in those, in those areas that would slow him down. So what about a week then? Uh, you know, it's not too much different. I'm mean, going to have some meetings. Um, you Do you know. see many of your properties? Are you no. traveling to your properties? No. No. No, no very, very rare. High level, connecting with property management, connecting yeah. with your accountant you said every week. Yeah. So your power team really staying yeah. on part. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and they'll spend a lot of time raising funds. Like raising, raising funds. funds raising funds. Raising right? funds. Um, you know, and troubleshooting some stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I try not to get involved in the, the minor stuff. But uh, I think that's a really good point that I I'll, I'll will leave everybody on is that if that's the if that's the thousand dollar hour activity in your business that's that's a ten thousand dollar hour activity realistically if you're looking to build a hundred million dollar portfolio you cannot get stuck in the lower priority actions recognize where you're where you're the best at where you're the only one on your team that can do that you're the you're you're the best at raising capital how much have you raised anyways what was the last number. Uh, I'm not sure. It's over 10 million, but 10 million. Yeah, exactly so, uh, right. but that, like, that, and that's that's not including like private funds or that's just directly from investors, right? Funds do that. Like like a fund raises ten million dollars. Yeah, yeah, but a little faster than I've done it in the past. <laughs> uh, my my pace is picking up, my speed's picking up. Right? Oh like, I, I had a good I had a good month in April. I raised uh, two purchases, one investor, one point one million cash. Put it, he put in right, so that, that was a very successful month. Very successful right? month, and you know, it was a long time to build that relationship. We didn't jump right into that, but, okay? But yeah, yeah, so. you're planting a lot of seeds with a lot of people, they're kind of watching yeah. in the background, seeing you again at events, seeing you again. I don't know, that's a whole other show where we would find joint venture partners and stuff like that, but. You know what? I I I I come away with my brain full after chatting with you. So I hope that you guys have too. This has been an awesome show, and um, thanks for coming out. My pleasure. Yeah, that's it for another episode of Full Time Investor.